Well, good evening. Bonsoir, Monsieur le Directeur, collègues, doyen Yann Algan, les étudiants, les proches, les familles, tous qui vous soutiennent. It is a huge honor and pleasure to be here tonight to celebrate a fantastic moment for each of you. And I want first to start with my warmest congratulations. It's not easy getting a degree from Sciences Po, and you've done it. That's a real achievement. Now, what I'd really love you to do is to turn and applaud not the students in the room, but first their parents, their supporters and their family, and then their fantastic professors. So students, why don't you applaud them? So I've traveled today across the English Channel, as they call it in England, from Oxford University, where with my colleagues over the last eight years, we've been building the Blavatnik School of Government, another global school with a mission to improve government. And I will confess that in the course of building that school, I first met your dean, Yann Algon, but he wasn't yet at Sciences Po, and I was very keen to recruit him to Oxford. I'm very disappointed that we, that we didn't succeed, but I am delighted for you. It has been a real pleasure to watch the School of Public Affairs at Sciences Po grow and develop since its birth in 2015. And it is a real pleasure to be here tonight and to see its success in the faces of all these brilliant graduates. Jan Algon said already tonight that you are graduating at a time of real challenge as well as opportunity. And that's a world in which there are more and more clashing worldviews. I saw that this week. On Tuesday, I was in Mumbai in India with the governments of China and India at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, watching emerging economies building a whole new trade system of their own and building it with huge investments and with huge infrastructure. You can perhaps imagine my surprise when I returned to the United Kingdom on Wednesday morning to meet and to listen to a British minister who was arguing that Britain could lead the world once it's outside of the European Union. It could lead the world to build a new free trade order and bring global prosperity to all. Single-handedly, it would seem, in his belief. Again, it's a belief that clashes with probably a large part of his own government's cabinet and certainly many others in Britain. But it's not just at the international level that we're seeing these clashing views. It's at in almost every democracy of the world, in almost every country that each of you comes from. We're seeing majorities vote for anything except the establishment. And by the way, I think tonight you've all become the establishment. <laughs> and they're, they're not voting. Don't believe the people who tell you that the mass no longer believes in democracy, that they are xenophobic, or that they are ignorant. Not true. They're voting against the establishment because they simply don't believe that it represents them anymore. For 30 years, they've been told by trusted leaders 
in the public sector and in the private sector, that, that globalization will be managed in a way which will secure benefits for everybody. If they just work harder, their lives and the lives of their children will be better. And yet, what many, many are finding, and increasingly large numbers are finding, is that the mix of technology, of globalization, and of public policy is combining to shape a world in which jobs are getting worse, more precarious, lower paid, that schools are overcrowded, that health systems are underfunded, and people all over the world are asking, who is on my side? I want you to think about your own community and those with far less opportunity than you and ask who in the political system and who leading the private sector is on their side, in their view? Who do they trust? Now, the old establishment, that's me, that's perhaps just a few others in this room. They're trying to persuade each other in an old-fashioned way by giving speeches, by using mainstream media, public relations companies, political parties that are no longer getting votes, conventional, incremental economic policy prescriptions. But these times call for something different, or better put, in almost every democracy today, a majority of people are calling for something very different. And that is where each of you come in, each and every one of you. Because in your lifetimes, you are gonna to have to do nothing less than rebuild your democracies, rebuild your community and your society to make it more cohesive, and rebuild the economy to make it more inclusive. And you can do that. I really believe you can do that. And there's just three things I want to leave you with tonight that I think will help you to do that better than our generation have done it. The first sounds really simple. It's the ability to listen. You know, a London taxi driver once said to me, he asked me, what I did as a job. I said I was a professor. And somewhat to my surprise, he said, you know, the more educated a person is, the less they actually know. I thought, oh, that's an interesting point. But I thought about it more and thought, actually, there is a danger here that the more educated the, you, that you are, the more time you spend talking and the less time you spend listening. That you come to great universities and you learn theories and you learn concepts and you learn facts and you learn evidence. And then there's a little risk that when you go out into the world, instead of really listening and observing things that you don't know, you squeeze them into your grand theory, you squeeze them into your data set, you squeeze them into what you've learned. And that might explain why the establishment failed in the United States to understand why people would vote for President Donald Trump. It might be why the establishment in the United Kingdom failed to understand why people would vote for Brexit. They were perhaps too educated to remember to listen. I know you'll do better. I hope you'll do better. And what will help you do better is if your team itself is every bit as diverse as the community you're trying to represent. It's a point that even Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest asset manager makes. He says, if your board doesn't look like in all the race, gender, etc., if it doesn't look like your customers, you will fail in the long term. You won't have the resilience you need to survive as a successful firm. You need a diverse team so that you can actually understand the world around you from all the perspectives that are being brought to bear.
So my first reflection to you is really work at learning to listen far better than we, the older generation, have done. My second reflection is actually about boldness. Many around you will caution you to be careful, not to make mistakes. And I guess I would say to you all, but perhaps particularly to a lot of young women in the room, don't let your anxieties, don't let your doubts hold you back. Learn to discipline yourself to be bold. Learn to be your own best supporter. And don't be afraid of making mistakes. It's by making mistakes that we learn really quickly. When I first arrived in the United Kingdom as a New Zealander, I got all confused with these titles that the British love to use. In fact, I watch students in my school get confused every year. So I rang a secretary and asked to speak to Sir Smith. She said, and I will never forget, now look, my dear, you are now in Britain. You must understand that it is Sir and then a first name, or Lord and then a second name. Do you have that clear? <laughs> I got it clear. If I hadn't made that mistake, I would never have got it so clear. So even little mistakes are worth making to learn quickly. But the other thing I want to say about boldness and mistakes is try to make your mistakes original. And what does that mean? It means do your homework. Don't, make, don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you're the first person ever to try something. Instead, if you want to educate children in a refugee camp, before you set up your own NGO or, or startup to do it, ask yourself, who is already doing this that's the best in the world? And how can I join them and learn from them? In computer science, it's called standing on the shoulders of giants. But for each of you, it's simply saying, when you embark on something, ask, who does this best? What can I learn from them? And what mistakes do they make that I can avoid so that I can be bold enough to make mistakes, but my mistakes will be original? And my final reflection here tonight is actually about leadership. Humans do need leadership because collectively we can do so much together. But groups need someone to help clarify and define what they're trying to achieve and someone to help to mobilize them to achieve that. And I'm sure every one of you have found that. In a top university like Sciences Po, it's hard, because every one of you probably thinks, actually, I could do this faster and quicker all by myself, but I have to somehow do it with these six people. That's what happens in Oxford anyway. So how are you going to mobilize your community? How are you going to mobilize the people around you? You can do it using muscle, using money, using your position, using your power. But mostly all you'll get is the appearance that people are doing things. You can use your ambition and attract other ambitious people who want to climb up the same ladder as you. But my reflection is that groups of self-interested people, of people focused on their own ambition, seldom achieve anything long-lasting. So the final way you can do it is through purpose, and that's to bring together people who share your purpose, not necessarily your ambition, and you're not necessarily incentivizing them to join you, but they come together with shared purpose. And here's the thing I really want to say to you tonight. You will find those people in unlikely places, and I would urge you to find those people in unlikely places. Look in the political party that opposes you. Look in the religion that's most different to your own. Look in the countries that you think might be your enemies. Look in other groups that you think are oppositional to you. Because if you can learn to find 
coalitions in unlikely places, the people that you are astonished to find yourself working with, you'll achieve change that's far more lasting and far more meaningful. So, graduates of 2018, I want to just say, have fun, be joyful, that's gonna be your best mobilizing technique. Make mistakes that you can learn, for, learn from, learn ever better to listen, and go ahead with all the boldness it's going to take to make a positive difference to the world. I salute you all. Thank you.